and coming back to your seats and joining us here once again for the policy uh, response session. I, I hesitate to go with policy solutions, which it was advertised a little earlier. Uh, we're going to do our best to have a conversation about the kinds of policy responses that might be needed. Uh, my name is Chris Haney. I'm the executive director of the California Budget and Policy Center. We're a nonprofit policy shop in California that does work on state and local policy with the goal of improving outcomes for low and middle income Californians. Uh, I was previously with the National League of Cities, as was said, and spent a lot of time in conversations, discussions just like these uh, around what's happening with trends in city finances, city economic conditions, uh, what are the types of responses that are needed. So it's a real pleasure to be back here with you all, with some old friends, longtime friends. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces and some new faces and see if we can generate a dialogue uh, that starts to talk about what kinds of policy interventions do we need that would be helpful to city governments and to city leaders as they uh, encounter the short and long cycles that come with the uh, life and growth of cities. Um, uh, I wanted to say a couple of things real quick uh, to sort of start this off before introducing folks. Um, I, we were in a room like this. Uh, it was in 2009 or 2010 uh, in the heat of what was the state and local government fiscal crisis that emerged after the Great Recession. And there was this very uh, poignant moment in one of these Urban Institute events where I remember uh, someone saying at the time, the real question is, are we going to waste a crisis? Um, and I was thinking about that as we led into this panel, and then I was thinking about it in terms of the research that's been presented this morning, and I think you'd have to conclude we probably or mostly did. Uh, and so the question is here, once again, what did we learn? What do we know? How can we do better going forward to improve the conditions for cities? And we have two people with this at current, one about to join us, uh, who are going to help us with that conversation. Amy Liu, the director of the Metropolitan Policy Program at the Brookings Institution. Scott Smith, former mayor of Arizona, who lived through the Great Recession. He managed to structure his term so he could just be there for all of it. Uh, and then we're going to be joined by the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, Nani Colaretti, who is running late, uh, but will be here shortly and will join us as we get going. So um, I wanted to start uh, by asking a question I sort of posed here already, which is, um, with hindsight, as uh, in our, you know, in the sort of way Tracy said, which is we always sort of have a chance to look back and ask what we learned. Uh, my question to, to, for the panel is to start with the question of what did we learn, what did we experience out of the last six, seven years, right? A period of dramatic decline and then kind of gradual growth upward that we can take forward in terms of positioning ourselves for it. So I'm going to start with Mayor Smith and ask you about the experience you had. Uh, how you managed through it, and then what you think the takeaways might be going forward. You do realize I have spent thousands on therapy trying to get over reliving <laughs> the experience, and now you've brought back all these. <laughs> I, I'd, like to, I'd like to focus on one thing you said, and did we waste a crisis? And I, I think in some ways we did, but in a way that's different than most people think. And that's because this crisis is different than any other crisis we've ever had. Uh, and that is that there has been no real recovery. There's been a, a, a significant shift uh, politically, economically, uh, in, in the world that, uh, that cities live in and the mayors live in. And so um, I think what, what concerns me is that we haven't, it's not that we've, uh, we haven't learned from what we went through. Because I think in some ways cities have learned. They have changed the way they do business. They have uh, refocused. Uh, I used to, used to kid my, uh, my Democratic mayor friends that uh, I've never seen so many Democrats uh, be best buds with the Chamber of Commerce as they became during the Great Recession. And it was a major shift on how, how, uh, how mayors uh, saw the interaction between uh, fiscal and economic health and overall community health and recognizing that all parts of the community need to be participants in this. But what concerns me is that as we move out of this, we have in many ways accepted a new norm. And that new norm is a norm in, in, in many cases of average, of mediocrity almost. Because in the last recessions, we learned during the recession, and then we took the prosperity, the job, the, re, uh, the, the job growth and everything that came after the recession to put into place these things we learned. And we, we haven't really been able to do that. So what is our new reality? Number one, uh, job growth, if it came back, is very different than what it was before. And it's more than just a... Uh, uh, than just a, uh, a, an elimination of or a shift of manufacturing jobs. Uh, we, we've been dealing with the service sector uh, 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 
movement. The second thing, though, is, is federalism and the new relationship between the federal government and cities, which has dramatically changed over the last uh, six to eight years. And most mayors now go into, some, uh, go into their, their term recognizing that the flow of cash from Washington is just not, you can't expect it. And if you do expect it, it's going to be sporadic, it's going to be very focused. The other thing is the, sh is the change in relationship, or the worst, I would say the worsening in relationship between state and cities. Mm. Uh, which, is, which is really not seen, but there is, in Arizona and other places, California places, there is literally a war between state governments and city governments as both, as both parties were, were, were clamoring for survival during this and looking at their sources of revenue, and everything's been turned upside down as shared revenue's been attacked, uh, uh, local control's been attacked, and I, it hasn't been getting better in the last year or two. Uh, the other thing is the, real, is the reality that uh, what Bob talked about, these, these costs. I call them dead costs. I mean, that may be a little bit morbid, but for example, in the city of Mesa, first of all, city governments are service-related. Uh, service and in any service industry, your, your, your number one expense is going to be uh, people, and people costs. And most cities going into the recession uh, the average was about 70 to 75 percent of a, any city's budget was on people costs. Wages, benefits, pensions, things like that. Uh, in my tenure, my six years as mayor of Mesa, I saw our labor, our overall people costs rise from just under 74 percent to 80 percent, and that didn't count any wage increases. Those increases were purely related to benefits and funding of pensions. And we don't run our own pensions. We're part of the statewide pension. Simply 6% of our overall budget, that's millions and millions and millions of dollars that went into basically taking care of, uh, without adding one bit to, the, to our ability to provide service. That is the new norm that cities have. So I think when we talk about, uh, about how we've learned, um, part of it is good in that I, I do think that cities have, have, have learned, uh, and mayors especially, have learned how to lead through an ongoing crisis and, and bring a community together and focus on economic uh, opportunity and development. But on the other hand, in many ways, we've accepted a new norm, which is the overall service level and our ability to provide service has really degraded in cities. Our infrastructure investment is degraded uh, and everything has gone down. And that's to be expected in the short term, but we seem to have accepted it from a political standpoint over the long term. And that's my greatest concern. Great. So, uh, Amy, I know that uh, over the course of this period of time, you've also worked with a lot of the major cities in the country, major metropolitan in the area, including Scotts, uh, and working with them about their economic development, their economic base, their fiscal base. As you worked with those communities, we, how is what you told them uh, consistent, changed as you've learned from this, and what are you telling them now? Hmm. Well, uh, just to bridge the previous conversation, I think Bob or one of the conversations mentioned you know, the importance of trying to uh, recognize or reconcile the economic structure of a city with its fiscal base. And I think that is often the tension I hear a lot about in the, trying to either move a local economic development strategy or the regional economic development strategy because of the short-term desire to grow fiscal base, um, pay for basic services, but also knowing that to restructure economy takes a long time. And the political reality of trying to reconcile those two things are very, very, very tough. And we can go on uh, more about that. Um, I, you know, I think that what we learned is right after the recession uh, with the collapse of the fiscal base, but a lot, really honestly, the collapse of jobs and the whole economy is most mayors, um, including um, Scott and his uh, peers in the Phoenix region, um, wanted to revisit the growth model. And the recession was a reminder that the old growth model wasn't going to work. One that was going to focus primarily on debt, consumption, real estate, versus the real um, drivers of the economy around innovation, around trade, and the real wealth creating opportunities for workers and industries in your community. And so this has been the big behavior shift I think we're beginning to try to see both trying to move from pure real estate transactions as the driver of growth um, versus a derivative of the kind of economy you want to create um, and doing so not just as single jurisdictions but doing it regionally 
And both of those shifts <laughs> um, are really complicated. But I do think that um, that is the sea change that is now underway. Um, so I would say, just as a story, um, you, you know, Phoenix was sort of the poster child of a real estate driven economy. And I think Scott would tell you that he approached Brookings as the mayor then and said, like many mayors at the time, is we just became elected, uh, many of them coming in in 2008, 2010, and said we inherited a, a, a city economy in collapse and we need an economic strategy, we need a job creation strategy, but we want one that is gonna be different, that's gonna take us out of this doldrum and we don't want the same old, same old. And Scott and a lot of his peers said, we are tired of our cyclical nature of our economy, boom and busts. We are tired of a, uh, an economy that is completely based on real estate and housing booms and housing construction and often the low wage jobs that are associated with that. Um, we need to move to a much more higher value, more stable uh, growth trajectory for our future. Uh, how do we get off the addiction of real estate? That was the word that you all often used. And, um, you know, fast forward through their process, they decided to create an economic agenda that really was around um, the sort of advanced industries that do exist in Phoenix. I think most people don't recognize that they do have um, real assets beyond the real estate assets in the community. And um, they brought together all the municipalities in the region, but they also brought together sort of the employers and the business community that represented the future economy. So oftentimes, if you sit around and think about your economic development strategies, there are a lot of developers in the room. But in this case, there was a very deliberate effort to bring representatives and business leaders uh, that represented the future economy, the entrepreneurs, the software uh, leaders, uh, the folks representing computer electronics and so on. And what I would say right now is, uh, their plan, which is still, I think, a long-term strategy, is um, called Velocity, which is how does this region accelerate and transform their economy into an innovation economy based on the assets at ASU, uh, around R&D and technology uh, capabilities around their emerging industries, around how to create um, and st uh, staff up a, a, a STEM workforce particularly for a lot of their low-skill workforce and their diverse workforce that they can participate in the economy? And how do we make sure that the products and services we, we produce are sold around the world, particularly since we are right at the Mexican border? And so really thinking about Phoenix's role in the global economy in a very different way and doing so very deliberately, thinking that this is going to create a lot more stability in the, in the way we generate revenues going forward. Um, so and I, I, those are the kind of conversations we're seeing in more and more jurisdictions. And, 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 but, but, and to get back to what Amy said, and we undertook a, a lot of things to try and change that, that's a hard conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and because the politics on a, on, a, on a local basis are very different than other politics. And at the end of the day, it, all, you know, it is a political uh, exercise. And to get back to what Bob said, uh, when he ran into someone at the grocery store, that was my daily life as a mayor. Uh, I mean, I, I literally got up and I said, I, I, you know, I worried about what I wore to the grocery store for heaven's sakes. <laughs> I'm in Costco and people come up to me all the time. That's what you live. And that's, that's the great thing about local government. On the other hand, that's a great impediment to creating regional, uh, regional uh, um, um, uh, comp, uh, uh, cohesion. Yeah, cohesion, thank you. <laughs> uh, and to get back to what, something that Tracy said, talked about, I don't, so whites, people don't start things. Tracy, let me, let me tell you the realities of, of <laughs> leadership. Mayors like two things. Mayors like to go to ribbon cuttings. They don't like to go to ribbon cuttings in a neighboring city. <laughs> and the reality is, is that they like ribbon cuttings better than they like groundbreakings because the plaque that is on the building is put there at the <laughs> ribbon cutting, not at the groundbreaking. <laughs> this is true. And so what happens is that most of these most of these projects take multiple years. And with term limits and things like that, there is, and when you're running into people in the grocery store every day, and you recognize it may take me five, six, eight years. Velocity is now in its seventh, eighth year. I'm gone. And things change when you leave. 
and there is a disincentive, number one, to really work regionally and also to work long term. And I think if you look at it, if you want to look at a, a glaring example, uh, you know, New York City. There's a reason why Michael Bloomberg went back and wanted a third term. Because eight years wasn't enough to get done what he wanted to get done. There's also a very, very different way that Bill de Blasio is, is leading New York City his, as, as opposed to Michael Bloomberg. And so that's what, that's what mayors uh, um, and, and city leaders really deal with in both the regional context and also in the context of their own political lives. And that drives a lot of these, the ability to shape policies that actually confront the realities that were brought out uh, uh, in, in, the, in the, the presentations before. Uh, and that's a great impediment. The other thing is central city versus suburbs. It happens everywhere in the country. People left the central city to go to the suburbs to escape the central city at the time. Now the idea is, well, why are people wanting to come back? Well, number one, this life cycle truly does exist. But the other thing is that the suburbs now have the same problems that the cities did. Because most suburbs are now 40, 50 years old. They have infrastructure which is falling apart. And the change in the millennials and whatever it is, organically, the central city doesn't look like a bad place anymore. Right. Uh, and so these things just happen. But there's still this struggle between central city and suburbs. And there always will be because of the different ways you look. Those are the political realities. Great. Well, I want to welcome Nani Coloretti, who has just Hi. been able to join us. Thank you. Yeah. And so we started this conversation with the question of uh, what have we learned that we can take with us going forward around public sure. policy to address uh, the cyclical nature of sure. what cities and states and all governments face. Uh, so the question for you, uh, in the context that, um, of your background as budget director for Mayor Gavin Newsom in San Francisco up through 2009, but then having been a treasury and at HUD uh, in the time since, and having seen it at two different levels of government, yeah. what would you offer in terms of uh, lessons learned? Sure. So first of all, thank you for having me here. And I'm really sorry I'm late. A word on infrastructure. Um, <laughs> uh, actually, enough, I did not realize that every street between here and HUD is actually dug up. So um, really should have taken Metro, because um, then you don't have to stop. But then Metro's not really working. So. <laughs> Uh, I am a victim of our own infra crumbling infrastructure. So um, let me just say a couple things that uh, might be of interest, which is I was in, uh, I was the budget director for San Francisco in September 2008. I don't know if you already shared your war stories about Phoenix, but you know, you, you, I'm sure you have many. We lost half of our discretionary budget over the course of a few months, and we had already started spending that budget because we were partway into the fiscal year. So I always talk about it like, you know, we forward budget our revenue in San Francisco. Many cities do this. Um, it's like if you have 120 bucks and you're going to spend 10 bucks a month, and about three months in, you know, you spend $30, and somebody comes up to you and goes, you know, it's, you're not really getting 120. You're really getting $100. And you're like, oh, OK. So I have till, <clears throat> I have till June to kind of cut back, trim a little. So we did that at the first brush. And then revenue estimators came up to me and said, yeah, you really only have like $90 for the rest of the year. I'm like, oh, OK, we're going to have to you know, furlough, lay off, whatever. So we're starting to do like harder things, you know, stop doing certain things. At the end, it was as if they had come up to me and said, you only have $75. At this point, it's like January or February. We have till June. We, at cities, you cannot run a deficit. It is not like the federal government. At least in California, the, the charter says you have to balance. And so we started doing very radical things at the, at the third. The only way we really got out of that quite frankly, was the Recovery Act. So the direct effect of the Recovery Act on San Francisco was we actually recalled um, several hundred, several thousand pink slips that we were about to send out. Because we had already been in overnight conversations with the unions. They gave back part of their salary, and they took furloughs. So it was like far deeper cut than we even felt here a few years ago in the sequestration. If you work in the federal space, you know what that was like. And that was the same thing. We were partway through the fiscal year, and they're like, actually, we don't have any money for you. <laughs> so like places like HUD had five furlough days, which really is like a pay cut. That, that, so anyway, so that was super fun. And um, we actually, I actually reached back to San Francisco. We had done a, we had put a few things in place to try to stabilize this kind of a fiscal shock. The revenue that comes into cities is very subject to a shock. This was actually a huge shock, right? Because it was felt all over. Um, but San Francisco did a bunch of really smart uh, things, but they had to go to the voters to ask them to do it. 
So they did some long-term planning. They now have two-year budgeting. They have a much bigger rainy day fund. They have capital planning that is 10-year and five-year, depending on which infrastructure you're talking about, um, so that they can better weather another um, event. And the event could be you know, um, man-made, uh, or, or in the case of San Francisco, uh, a climate event or an earthquake. So they have done a number of really uh, great, great things there um, that are kind of like specific to San Francisco. But what's happening in San Francisco is actually happening in a lot of what I call high-cost cities, which is because they were able to fortify themselves and sort of turn around their economy. And, and we at HUD and even in San Francisco think of it as multi-prong, right? It's not just like one part is recovering. We had to like recover in uh, lots of places, including transportation, education, um, infrastructure, and so forth. Um, but now the median price in San Francisco last year was $1.1 million. So now no one can live there. I mean, unless you're you know, part of the 1% or whatever percent is working in the tech sector. Um, so that's a problem. Um, a lot of people want to live there, and there are you know, supply issues with the housing. Um, so, so that's a different kind of problem, and we're doing a lot of work at HUD to work both on that problem of affordability, but also on some regional things um, from the federal space, which you can talk about more if you want to. Well, I, I wanted to, uh, you mentioned ARA, uh, and yeah. one of the things we know from the research that was presented earlier this morning is that over time, as the federal government has encountered its own cyclical issues and political issues, those kinds of ongoing commitments have diminished, right? And whether they were for, you know, sort of trigger responses to cyclical changes or to invest in infrastructure or whatever the case may be. But we had ARA, right? And, it, and you know what San Francisco had helped. I know from talking with a lot of city officials uh, during that time it was helping. But it also went away. So I, you know, my question is sort of what do we do to get back to an era where the federal government is, uh, in terms of funding, not just regulatory structures, uh, in a spot where it's a, a fiscal, more of a fiscal partner. Right? And, you know, and HUD has essentially the last remaining vestige of one of those eras of federalism in the Community Development Block Grant. Which, by the way, in real dollar terms, has not been increased. It's actually gone down yeah. uh, in the 40 plus years it's been. So we're funding, what, 3.6 billion, something like that? 3 billion. Yeah. 3 billion. yeah. Started out at 3.6. In 1970, six dollars, okay, yeah, or 1974 so, dollars. Right. So, uh, you know, in actual dollars. And I, I think to answer that, if I'm a mayor, I don't expect that to ever change. Mm -hmm. uh, in the current environment, unless in some way uh, uh, the, the change in government control, uh, whereas one party or another has super majorities in the House, Senate, and, uh, and, and the administration, you're not going to see that change. Uh, I can tell you as, as a mayor and president of this conference, we'd go up to count, uh, Capitol Hill a lot to talk about city issues, city problems, and it was a very interesting experience. Uh, uh, to, to, to talk to both sides, uh, you know, and to talk to my Republican uh, uh, mates and have the most blank look in the face as if, why are you talking to me about city issues? Yeah. You do not realize what I'm dealing with. And to have someone like Barbara Boxer from, uh, from California, who, who has not been mistaken for a conservative icon, uh, <laughs> to tell straight to, our straight to our face, gas tax is off the table. We're not even going to bring in the gas tax increase. That's a liberal Democrat. So you get it both from... That, that, that's the way that the federal government works now is that some of these issues like restoring and going and, 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 and putting uh, uh, the sharing uh, is not even on the table in many ways. So I think cities, and you're gonna have to, uh, they're going to have to fend for themselves. That's not wholly bad because I think one of the things, uh, and what Nani talked about, and I, I had a similar experience. I was in office three weeks when my budget department came and said, oh, by the way, Mayor, <laughs> well, yeah, our, our, and Mesa is, is completely sales tax driven. We have no primary property tax, so we're dealing with sales tax. And, and I we came into office in June of 2008, and you know, the bottom fell out of the tax market. And like I said, we have to balance our budget. And I actually am one of those weird people that I like crises because it, you can be more innovative. You have more of a free I got to do stuff that I would have never been able to do in, uh, in a time of plenty. Because in a time of plenty, and this gets back to what Amy was saying, people don't want to change. Uh, and that's one of the things that as you come out of a recession, I think right now we're okay. We're not bad, but we're not as bad as we used to. There isn't really the, uh, the natural incentive to innovate. The great thing that happened, and, and I talked about it, is that cities have to deliver services. That's the one difference between us and other levels of government. And I'll give you a great example. The Zika 
virus. Has anyone been following what Congress has been doing <laughs> to encounter the Zika? Now, how the Zika is connected with Planned Parenthood and all these other uh, uh, issues, I have no idea. But Congress has not appropriated over a billion dollars to fight Zika. What are they doing down in South Florida? They're spraying. See, that, that's, that right there is a big difference. And it doesn't matter whether you have the money or not. You spray. You figure out a way to get it done. And that's what we did in the cities. We figured out a way so that our first responders could respond. Maybe it wasn't as quick as it used to be. Maybe it was in creative new ways. We figured out ways to use technology. We figured out a ways to expand our economy. So in a lot of ways, we didn't waste the crisis. Uh, we did it in ways that you may not know about. For example, in, in Mesa, uh, our libraries, that seems to be the first thing that gets cut because it's not life-saving, although it's important to a community. And we cut our budget 20% right off the bat. And, you know, we, we laid off across, we did more than furlough. We literally had to reduce our workforce. And in the libraries, we gave a challenge to our manager. We said, we want you to reduce the budget by 30%. Oh, by the way, and deliver the same level of services on 30% last month. And our, our staff got together, and, and after a year, they came back with this incredible plan with a combination of, of radically new procedures, technology, and everything. We found that after two years, the, the two measures of, of, library, uh, uh, of library activity, the number of patrons and the number of, uh, of uh, books and units uh, moved, had actually almost doubled on 30% less budget. How'd they do it? Technology. Uh, like I said, they, they got very, very creative. And uh, you go into cities, go into San Francisco, go into Boston, go into New York, go into these places, technology and processes are being improved at a way that you haven't seen. And one of the reasons is, is that they're saying, I can't rely on Washington. I'm not going to get the money from D.C. anymore. Well, right. And, 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 you know, having worked with the National League of Cities for a while and then watching it at the state government level in California, that's a fairly common refrain. Um, and yet we know that there has to be some interaction there. And, and, and the folks in Washington face their own constraints. So, Nani, um, you know, how, how do you operate within that, try to improve conditions, federal programs, how you work with local governments? Sure. I mean, just it's notable that even though the CDBG funding stream has gone down, HUD's actual overall budget has gone up. It's a $45 billion budget. Almost all of that money goes out to communities. Um, it, it just is in different um, and other kinds of categories. It's a great um, partnership with mayors on ending veterans' homelessness, for example, um, and uh, changing the way we do our homeless granting. So there's a lot of kind of cool, groovy things happening in the the grant world. The, what HUD has been uh, leading on is trying to change the way the federal, look, we're in the federal government, so I'm not like, I don't want to overstate our ability to, you know, directly change what's happening in a city right away. But we have been experimenting with over the course of this administration and have learned a lot about how to create um, partnerships with cities that make the federal government slightly more responsive to city-driven ideas on how to um, change and or to bring the right kinds of technical assistance to cities. So we started out with something called Strong Cities, Strong Communities, which is a partnership of 19 federal agencies. Um, and we've sort of put out a, a, a you know, request, a competition, and a bunch of cities applied. And they were supposed to be cities over 40,000 people but under a million. So we were targeting a specific group of cities and we were actually targeting cities that had a, a decent number of low income people and also cities that might be struggling with their own capacity. Um, and we, we, there were 14 cities over, over time that basically were getting a, a much, a very targeted in, um, sort of help where we're actually embedded a federal partner in the mayor's office there. Um, so, you know, St. Louis comes to mind and some other um, interesting cities and, and to try to basically be that um, circuit rider to help do some of the harder projects that really take um, a, a little bit of a longer view, not just the uh, this year view, but like a, a slightly longer view in some of the grants that were coming out then. And uh, from that, we actually learned a lot from uh, National Resource Network uh, technical assistance. And so there are, about, there are about 500 cities actually qualified to be part of the Strong City, Strong Communities work. And um, a little over 100 actually got technical assistance in some other work. I'll give you one more example. Providence was going to declare bankruptcy. They actually leveraged some significant fiscal technical assistance from the National Resource Network. And we were able to get, uh, work with them on a, on a budget plan and a 10-year plan. Uh, that, and we largely believe that that helped them actually not 
declare bankruptcy, which was, had been largely expected. So, so, so it's really trying to leverage sort of connecting best practices across the um, United States for cities that are both willing and able and can. And um, we've, we've parlayed that into um, promise zones, which are mostly in urban areas, but also in rural areas. There are 22 of these. And they have a special designation, actually no money behind the promise zone. It's a 10-year designation to um, get preference points on federal grants. And uh, we have the same kind of cross collaboration across all the uh, federal agencies. And it's, it's so far resulted in, in over a couple hundred million dollars going to communities that otherwise would not have gotten the, that funding, or we think may not have been able to get the funding without the preference points. But it's across education, transportation, and it is a little bit more of a regional approach. Sometimes it's a very specific set of neighborhoods in a city, but we also try to look for cross-jurisdiction on promise zones. Can, can yeah. I just add a couple observations on this one? Um, I thought it was really interesting, Tracy, that you tried to name this last era of federalism from the, uh, at least the Obama administration. I, would, I am not that optimistic about the amount of change that's going to happen in the next administration per um, what my Mayor Smith said um, in terms of the level of resources or additional flexibilities that can be allowed given the tensions between Congress and the administration. But that said, there are some positive things that and a lot of experimentation that happened in the last terms as it related to city solutions and bottom-up solutions that should at least, some dimensions of those should continue. And so whether you call it greater accountability or what we saw executive you know, federalism, I think the hallmarks of it was uh, definitely incenting. The behavior change to do multi-jurisdictional, cross-sector collaboration is really hard. Right, everything about the, the way these programs are currently structured and, your, um, and the embedded incentives is to, to not do that. And so when the administration really put joint funding out there or rewarded um, bringing these uh, different funding streams together or across multi-sectors um, um, ap applications, a lot of those were oversubscribed and it showed you the amount of demand and interest for those kind of solutions. So. And it didn't cost a lot of money. So I do think constantly putting out good, positive rewards and incentives to counteract um, sort of the status quo is really important. The second is a lot of co-investing happening in the absence of a lot of very little money, whether it's social innovation fund um, or um, really requiring matching grants for the federal, federal resources. I thought there were, I thought this administration did a really good job of really putting out challenges uh, whether it's through the federal innovation labs, um, the regional innovation accelerators, Tiger grants. I mean, you think, you name all of them. These were challenge grants, not too large, local flexibility, a lot of them requiring some kind of local match or some other kind of leverage. And honestly, I would tell you, doing that more often is really important because you want the federal investments at the beginning to last um, beyond the initial grants. And so having a little local skin in the game puts in rewards or creates some momentum of having some uh, local investments that may have the chance of, of maintaining those reforms or innovations going forward. The biggest concern was too few of these, too much focus on planning, not enough on implementation, you know, only one round, not two or three or multiple rounds. So I do think that there's going to have to be some really creative thinking uh, in the next administration about how to continue to reward, I think, you know, big, bold solutions that are bottom up. Um, because I do think that at this point, the cities and the regions are, have more capacity in many respects than are other levels of government to, 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 to step in on a lot of the big challenges of confronting our communities today. Um, and so we need to continue at least that direction uh, within the constraints that we have. And what, so and what Nani and Amy said doesn't disagree with what I said because yeah. as you said, there are good grant programs, mm -hmm. but what Amy said is true. Basically every one of them is not only oversubscribed, it's seriously oversubscribed. Uh, there are 19,000 cities and towns in America. 3,000 cities, over 30,000 in population. And when there's 22 grants, when there's 30 grants, that means that it's it's, you know, it's very focused in its slim pickings. And that's not to criticize uh, HUD or the federal government because they are coming up with some very good and innovative programs. But what it means is if you come into office, uh, you can't expect your whole plan on getting a grant because it, they're incredibly competitive. 
and there's 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 a lot more demand than there is uh, uh, than there is uh, than there is right. money. And so what you have to do is you have to you have to get creative. You have to leverage off of what other cities do, partner with uh, private sector, partner with others in your region, and that's what you need to rely on most of all. You cannot, as in the days past, this is where the big changes come. Go in thinking, well, there will be federal money to do that. Whether it be build a highway or your, or your uh, light rail system or whatever, that isn't a given. That's probably your fallback. And boy, if we get lucky or we get good and we get that, we'll have that. But if we're going to do this program, we better plan on trying this, this, and this before we fall back on federal. If I could say something just about competitions, though, um, there is a sort of ripple effect or a multiplier effect on a competition when you run when you run one so we did a one million billion dollar national um, disaster resilience mm -hmm. competition on the heels of sandy one of the biggest trends cities will be facing are facing already right is the effect of climate change and so the notion is you know don't just rebuild what you had before try to think of different ways to build a resilient infrastructure or um, you know resilient housing uh, and so forth and so we we ran this competition and it actually was run in several stages and there were uh, you know some some folks at the back end that finally got the money but there were a number of finalists that went through Rockefeller sponsored and this was what I'd say about partnerships we had foundation right. funding in the game uh, Rock, Rockefeller sponsored um, resilience academies and training and so the, all of those folks went to that and so even some of the regions or cities that actually did not in the end get a grant to go do some rebuilding um, uh, you know, and really I had no reason to say thanks for, for not giving me money. <laughs> but they did. They said thanks for not giving me money because it actually required me to partner with all these folks. And we now have a plan, which takes a lot of resources to, to create. And part, you know, on the ground you're much more accountable to the people in the grocery store, or in your, down your block. Or, uh, that actually also required community uh, engagement to create it. So they have a plan and they were very happy that we had invested in that. Um, and so I, I guess what I would say is in, in when there isn't enough money to hand out to do a ribbon cutting, there actually is an after effect sometimes of competitions that have to really do with capacity building um, in the main. And we're seeing some of the effects of that even with those that didn't get a promise zone or didn't, didn't get the, the embedded staffer for strong cities, strong communities we're actually getting results in their region or in their community in different ways. And it's, it's really, it, look, we're just meeting people where they are. So there are cities who are like, yeah, you and your federal partnership, we don't want to apply for that. You know, and they're not at the table. Um, but there are many, many, many that are, and, they, and they, they get benefits even if they don't get the money. Sure, good. So uh, we're also having a set of national conversations, or I would say at least there's a, there's a really heightened level of attention to issues around widening income and wealth disparities, poverty levels, access to economic opportunity. Uh, and we're talking here today about the resilience of cities. And we saw a research presentation earlier that talked about how that the rise of a population that's more vulnerable in your city is both bad for its sort of economic growth, obviously, uh, but that cities have to be careful about their redistributive policies in terms of their own commitments. So, what, so, so how important is the set of responses we need to have around responding to these crises, uh, and how do we, what are those responses across the different levels of governments or regional authorities? And so I'm going to turn to Amy first to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I just uh, earlier this year put out a paper called uh, Remaking Economic Development. Um, and it was based on the lessons of working with uh, dozens of cities and metropolitan areas and business and civic uh, leaders around the country over the last five years post-recession and trying to create um, what the economic development literature has been telling us for decades about how to create real value, real income, real productive um, uh, outcomes in our communities that result in better wages for our residents. Um, and ultimately, that is uh, you know, the well-being for a lot of the work that we want to do. Um, and yet, so much of what happens in cities isn't there. So, um, and I saw that in the struggle with, as we just talked about with uh, the Phoenix area, we saw a lot of really well-intended um, business, civic, uh, political leaders really wanting to do the right thing, but very hard. So um, here's what I would say about um, the challenge now. I do think that um, you know when we look at the, our uh, economic indicators of the 100 largest cities and metropolitan areas, we are finding that um, 
the majority of our cities now and metro areas uh, post-recession are expanding. Mm -hmm. More jobs, uh, greater output, sort of reflecting the broader expansion of the national economy. But that growth is not translating to improved living standards, greater productivity, and uh, better wages and employment for workers. And so what that tells us is what we've always known from the literature, which is growth is not sufficient. And yet, uh, for raising um, the prospects of a lot of our residents uh, in, the, in the near and longer term. Um, so, however, I think a lot of our policies, even our federal, state, and local ones, are geared towards growth, 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 almost without any care to the quality of that growth. And so we need to continue to do the hard work of um, changing our policies, changing our practices, changing our incentives and behaviors, and the ways we collaborate to get to that higher value growth. And, um, and um, what, what would that look like? Um, what I would say is uh, there are five things we talk about in the paper that we are recognizing a lot more uh, regional, civic, and local leaders are coming together around. Uh, one is not focusing strictly on business attraction as the primary driver of economic development. Um, at the end of the day, uh, um, you know, I, uh, at the end of the day, uh, the bulk of a region's growth comes from the base of its existing industries and creating the ecosystem, the environment for them to expand and grow. So we need, the first thing we need to do is we need to grow from within. We need to not look around and see how we move firms in and around, but really, you know, what are, what are we really good at? What do we produce? Talk to our companies, our existing base of manufacturers or, or service providers or technology and uh, firms or small firms and ask them, you know, where their growth is heading and how do we create an environment where you can expand? And a lot of that requires a focus on innovation capabilities, partnerships with the university or other sources of R&D. Um, so we can boost SME productivity in ways that can translate to higher wages or more jobs for workers. The sec and that also includes a focus on skills. Um, the second thing we need to do is we do need to focus on trade, even though there's a lot of uh, pushback against the uh, global economy right now. But we know that a lot of the income that comes from our metropolitan areas and regions are income from the fact that our products and services are sold outside of our region. And so that's how you grow the pie. It is not about moving the pie around in our communities. And so a focus on your trade and your traded sectors is really critical. Third is we do need to be much more deliberate about preparing our workforce for the demands that are coming in our economy. As you know, I think you know, Scott said it very well at the very beginning of this conversation. The jobs that are around today are not the ones that we had before. The economy that is being, the, the way our uh, small firms and mid-sized firms are being tested right now uh, in terms uh, is, is, you know, if their ability to adapt to the new world, new demographics, new technology, is gonna really challenge our ability to expand and grow. And so that means our workers need to keep pace with the changing demands of the technology um, and greater co global competition. So how do we prepare our workforce to do that and do so in a way that recognizes that um, our workforce is becoming more diverse. And uh, you know, there's, by the way, just as a segue, we've been working really hard trying to figure out what is explaining the lag in median wages in a lot of our metropolitan areas. Um, and there are multiple factors for that. Part of it is about the changing demographics. Um, we are retiring a lot more skilled workers, most of them white, and what's replacing them is a much more diverse workforce that tends to work in lower skilled jobs. The second is the supply of jobs that are being created in our communities. There is a proliferation of low wage work. Now that low wage work could be because there's not enough demand in our economy, but also because of the reflection of you know, how durable are the industries that we have right now. Um, and so I, so I do think that um, we need to constantly think through both on the demand and supply side, how do we helping our communities adapt to the realities. Last thing I would say is we need to connect our neighborhoods and our jurisdictions to that demand in the larger economy. Um, so many times I talk to community developers, uh, folks who are anti-poverty activists, a lot of the conversations from the earlier panel about poverty expenditures. And I think there's a real realization now that poverty conversations cannot be divorced from economic development. That, the, that jobs, the nature of the jobs, the ability to access those jobs 
are really important to ensuring that our residents have the incomes to stay in their neighborhoods if those neighborhoods change. And so how do we think about much more, and this is definitely the conversations in Chicago, how do we talk, how do we make sure as we're worried about violence in our streets um, that the broader gains in the larger economy is impacting certain neighborhoods or benefiting certain neighborhoods? And so that, there's a lot in that, but um, again, growing from within, focusing on skills, uh, understanding the power of trade and connecting our neighborhoods and our jurisdictions together to that larger economy will really make a difference. And, and, and the reality is, and to, to go back on some of the research that Amy and Bruce Katz did at, at, at Brookings, um, you know, the U.S. is still trying to figure out the world we live in from an economic standpoint. I mean, think about it. For 40 years, we had the run of the post-World War II. We were the only economy that was really dominating. I mean, it wasn't that we were that much better, it was just that we weren't bombed, we won, and the rest of the world was rebuilding. Europe was rebuilding, Asia was rebuilding, and so we had a, a natural, the GI Bill, all this, we had this incredible workforce that took advantage of a growing demand, and we were best positioned to do that, and we thrived. Well, you know, the rest of the world has caught up to us in a lot of ways. They, they've just grown into it, and so the question is, how will the U.S. Uh, respond. I think one of the things to, to add on to what Amy said is that a national policy is not going to mm -hmm. solve the problem because we really don't have a national economy anymore. We don't have a world economy. We have a series of metro economies and really this is a, it's going to be a bottom up, which is frustrating for mayors because what Amy says is, 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 is true in that what builds an economy and this is the challenge that, that mayors have. You did, the last time we talked about tax abatement is anything. Every city leader is tempted to no end to give out tax breaks and abatements. I was personally against mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. because those are short term, they're stupid. You get a headline that says, uh, I just gave away $100 million to create 300 jobs. You know, I have a Boeing fact, uh, assembly, uh, Apache helicopter in Mesa. Boeing gives and takes away three to 400 jobs every month on the normal ebb and flow. That never makes the headlines. And yet I'm gonna give away 50 million, 100 million dollars, so I can create 300, 500. It's a dumb, it's a dumb strategy. But the fact is, the mayors understand that we see this workforce that is undereducated, that the the immigrant workforce that doesn't have the opportunities, and yet we don't control the education system. Mm -hmm. We don't set the policies for the community colleges. We don't really create the uh, with without collaboration. Mm -hmm. We can't cr create the groundwork, and yet nobody knows. Uh, how a local economy works better than local leaders because we are constantly talking to our uh, to our business leaders, to our education leaders. And so I think one of the breakdowns we have, one of the strengths historically we've had is we have these siloed ways we provide service. Education is different from local government. That's good in a lot of ways, but in today's economy on the local and metro area, those have got to be a lot more collaboration. And we're learning how to do that, but what you see in great innovations and great the change of the, uh, of the uh, playing field, so to speak, economically, I'm sorry, is not going to come from here in Washington, D.C. There are obviously some very basic national policies that have a huge impact, tax, tax policy and other. But most of the, the nitty-gritty policies that will truly make long-term change are happening in the metro areas, and they're driven by local leaders, local education leaders, local business leaders, local uh, uh, government leaders like, like mayors, who are devoid, in most cases, of the hyper-partisan politics. I like to say that the difference between a city council meeting in most cases and a state legislature in Washington is that you go into a, a congressional hearing in Washington and they start arguing about ideology. And they might get to the, end of, to the problem. You may go through a whole committee meeting and never really know what the issue is. <laughs> and most time in a city council you start arguing about the problem and the ideological differences come out but you focus on changing things and solving problems. That doesn't happen so much at the state or even the, the national level. And that's why I, I have a lot of faith and confidence in our, in our metro uh, governments and local economies to change things. Well, so I know that uh, HUD is doing its best to actually work across these regional platforms, incentivize it, as Amy was saying earlier. By the way, HUD's one of the bright spots. 
We, we love and, I, before, and I'm not saying it just because she's yay. here, but <laughs> say, no, there's certain departments if you're, in, if you're in local government that you work with more than others. And the two big ones, uh, the two big ones in the federal government are the Department of Transportation and the HUD. And they, they probably have the, 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 the most direct impact and connection with local governments uh, of any department. Yeah, so, and, before you, and before you answer, I just want to remind you, so we're going to go to questions next. So be thinking about your questions or if you're watching online, uh, email through. Uh, to the aforementioned address. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I just want to provide a slightly different frame for this, um, which is we think of it as opportunity. And we're the Department of Housing, so we think of housing as a platform for opportunity because we have, you know, there's a lot of evidence that's coming out that place matters. Um, we, as Americans, think of ourselves as the land of opportunity, right? It doesn't matter where you're born or who your parents are or if you just immigrated here. Everyone has a fair shot. Um, our evidence most recently is actually showing that that's actually declined quite a bit. If you are born to the <coughs> lowest 25%, mobility means that if you're born to the lowest 25% of income in this country, you can move up, okay? If you're born today and you're in the lowest 25% of income in this country, you are, have a 46 to 47% chance of still being there when you're an adult. Okay, the comparable number for Canada, I mean, I hate comparing ourselves to Canada, but the number I have in front of me um, yeah. is 32%. So Canada is more mo economically mobile than the US. I actually saw figures that show that the UK is more economic. I think of the England as like, you know, when I read Dickens stuff, and like, you're born, and it's like <laughs> terrible, stay there forever. No, they're actually more economically mobile than the United States. Everybody's running around going, please, poor, more right, poor. Right, right, and you just stay there forever. Right. Sure. Yeah, so they're more economically mobile than us. And so, uh, so look, we well, look Oliver, at... Well, Oliver turned out pretty good. He moved uh, yeah. into a row house. Also, for like, starring in a musical and whatever. Okay, so, but... Dancing um, and singing, you're right. <laughs> There's lots of money in those musicals. But so, um, uh, so, so at HUD, we uh, look at what, what is, why is that, and we have a lot of uh, evidence. We've been working very, uh, with rigor, on um, affirmatively furthering fair housing, which uh, was something we were supposed to do 48 years ago when the Fair Housing Act passed, and we just put out the rule last year. Um, and uh, we could talk more about it if you want to, or offline, it's, it's super interesting, and there's a lot of cool, groovy data that we're gonna be um, providing to um, all, all localities just to see what's going on with that. But place matters in that um, uh, we believe it is actually, you know, your neighborhood and the, the opportunities afforded to you in your neighborhood that are contributing to this non-mobility. Right, so where in St. Louis, if you're born in one uh, neighborhood outside of, you know, just right outside of the city, maybe 10 miles away, you, you're gonna live until you're, I don't know, 82, and if you're born 10 miles down the road, you actually live, you're, you're actually, even today, you have a 14 year less life expectancy. And that's in our country today. Um, so kids born in, in certain kinds of neighborhoods are, are having a harder time just living longer, just your health outcomes, forget the economic ones and so forth. So we're using uh, housing as a platform to, and, and places as a platform to increase opportunity at the kind of ground level. And that is with partnerships um, such as the ones I talked about earlier, um, but also with some of our own policies on how mobile our housing vouchers are. Um, and then also, what are we doing to actually improve the neighborhood themselves? It, it sort of feels a little bit like the charter school debate. You don't want to have everybody going to charter school, and then what do you do about the school that like, never got improved? So we're doing a both and um, strategy and working with communities to actually improve the community itself but also allowing mobility for um, families that want to move to a higher opportunity community and we're doing a whole bunch of other um, policies there just with our, our own hot envelope but through partnerships trying to really work on some of the things that um, we talked about earlier which is what, what are your uh, workforce opportunity what are you are you going to be trained to be the worker of the future if the job of the future is no longer the job of yesterday and um, there are a lot of things we're doing in partnership across the federal space. The final thing I want to leave you with is um, the federal government isn't uh, rigged up very well to work with localities, as you mentioned before. It's, it's actually not the first place you go in a city to get help. I mean, sure, if there's a grant out, maybe you'll write for that. But, but what we're doing with HUD, two-thirds of our staff are actually in communities. They're not here in um, D.C. And we're doing some on the ground level ways to just change the way we as the federal government work with communities. And so it's a whole host of um, technical assistance and just changing people's job description and what we're expecting of them. So changing our expectations of ourselves 
so that we can be better partners. And that's something that we think will be a capacity building for the federal space that lives beyond the administration. It's something that will help you know, future, future cities and future HUD employees. So we're going to start uh, taking questions. Uh, just to remind you a bit about process, if you're here in the room, uh, raise your hand. Someone will bring you a microphone. Please introduce yourself and uh, your affiliation or where you're from. Uh, and then those of you that are online can submit questions, and those will get fed up here to the podium. So yes, right here in front. Hold on just a second. Hi, thank you for some very interesting comments and points. Natalie Cohen, Wells Fargo. Um, so a number of cities have voted in the last couple of years to raise the minimum wage. And I wonder if some on the panel could comment on the impact of that as far as improving or raising standards and so on. Um, an interesting trend, I think, given as Amy was talking about the changing composition of the labor market, a lot of food workers, a lot of health workers, and so on. So I'm just wondering what the thoughts are on that. So I'm going I'm to start with that because I'm coming, coming at it from California, a place where several cities did make the move to higher minimum wages, and now the state has made that move. Uh, the first thing I would say is it has to be a part of the equation. Uh, we can't talk about raising wages and combating income disparities without raising the wages somehow of folks at the lowest end. It's not the only part of the equation. Minimum wage works great when you combine it with your income tax credit or uh, food assistance programs and the like. Those things combine to raise the, uh, things up. So we know that it can be a positive part of the equation. We, I don't think we know completely what a $15 minimum wage means in all regions. And I think this is a good example of how we keep uh, often creating policies that are Sort of, you know, they're the levers we can pull without ever using the technical expertise we have to do it better. So if I could, you know, design an ideal minimum wage in California, we know technically how to construct it regionally. It's complicated. It would make it more difficult politically, but it would be better for the regional markets. We don't do it. We know how, right? Um, so it would be nice if we could start moving some of these policies in the directions of where we have the tech technical expertise to do it better, match it up with the regional economies. Uh, we just don't have the sort of, the systems aren't rigged up that way, to use Nani, Nani's comment. So that's my reaction. I'll let some of the others uh, react. Here. Um, I think raising minimum wage is a lazy policy. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a feel-good policy. Uh, it does not, it, 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 not that I'm against people raising, uh, raising that, but the fact of the matter is, and I, I just want well, you know, I was in private business for 30 years before I got into government. Uh, First of all, we've learned a few things about government mandates, about government things, and, and our history has shown that those have unintended consequences that tend to work against and don't create an overall broad base. Uh, I would prefer that we work on the things Amy was talking about. Uh, you know, you look, at, you look at thriving economies and they never pay the minimum wage. When there's 3% employ unemployment, nobody pays minimum wage because the market has elevated. Is not, and I don't want to be oversimplistic about the rising tide, because uh, I think that can be oversimplistic also. But I would rather put our efforts and have great debates on how we can expand educational opportunities. Uh, just because you have uh, unskilled labor and say you're now going to pay them 15%, that is not a lifetime changer. Give that person education. Give that person opportunity. Change our economy to create innovation. All of a sudden, you have created a lifetime uh, of opportunity, and I just believe that simply raising, it lay, uh, raising a minimum wage is, uh, is a feel-good, lazy policy. Other than that, I have no strong feelings. <laughs> <laughs> what others? Okay. Yes, sir. In the blue shirt with the red tie. <laughs> Unless I'm colorblind. Tracy scolds me for not identifying myself. George Friedlander at Citigroup. Um, I, my question could take 15 minutes, but it won't. <laughs> I'll, I'll summarize it down to... A That's lot right, of the I'll stuff. Take Twenty minutes to answer. So uh, go ahead. A, lo a lot of the stuff I'm looking at relates to technological change, and my my response on the question of minimum wage is that I fear that y if you go too high, what you're, do you're doing is creating a, a fair employment act for robots, um, mm -hmm. which gets back to my larger 
issue is, I, 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 there is no doubt in my mind that a very, very large proportion of the innovation that's going to occur is going to occur bottom up. It's going to be cities up through states to the federal government, not the other way around. The, the concern that I have is that even with that and all the w wonderful work that's being done, for example, at Brookings on advanced industry cities, is that the problem is you end, still end up with a zero, zero sum game that unless you're growing the, the, the national economy, yes, some cities d get wonderful benefits out of an advanced industry city approach and a smart city approach, but by beggaring other cities that don't keep up. Um, and that worries me a lot, that without a federal, uh, a substantial federal role, um, you don't build the whole pie, and, and my, the, the easiest, easiest example on that is simply infrastructure funding. Um, if we don't solve that at the federal level um, it, as a part of the solution, we don't solve it, period. So I don't know if it was a question in there, but I think there was. I didn't, well, let me tell you, say one thing very quickly. Uh, I don't want you to think I'm anti-federal. There are some problems and some issues that to scale them, you need resources in the federal government is the entity that's best placed first. They have the broader reach, and they also have the resources to commit partnering with, for example, the cities to create good things. And, and if we did more of that, it would be amazing. I mean, I think both candidates right now, uh, the, there are four candidates for president, but the two leading candidates have infrastructure plans. So I think that has at least been heard in the, you know, in the, even in the, I, I can't imagine they're agreeing on any, much else, anything else, but um, they both have an infrastructure plan. Now would be a good time um, to invest in that. Does it, it does increase jobs? I mean, you know, in the so, short and long run. So I I would say that we do have a national problem around uh, both a, a sluggish economy right now, the the new normal that the mayor talked about, um, where we do have stagnant productivity and we have stagnant income growth. That is a national problem. However, I do think there are things that the federal government can do and must do to address those, some of the structural issues that are behind that. But I also think that the regions, the cities and the metropolitan areas and the business and civic leaders also have to do their part because there are, each regional economy is not the same. So I would tell you I'm actually less worried about whether people are uh, competition between places because each region actually has its own unique products and services they produce, they have their own market failures that they have to address. They have different kinds of institutions that can provide the community college or skills pathways. They have different kinds of industries. Someone had asked earlier about life cycles of cities. You know, I probably hang out with Ned Hill too much. I think of cities as a reflection of the product life cycles of the industries that are in their communities. So if you're really at the forefront of creating new products and design, you're going to be at a high growth mode. If you're at the tail end of a production side of an industry, you're going to be a slow growing. So you, you, your economy in some ways reflects some industry mix that you have. And so every single metropolitan area has a very different industry mix and different su kinds of suppliers and firms that participate in the product life cycle of, a f of that industry. And so to me, what I would argue is every single metropolitan has a chance, has an opportunity to put in place the policies, the collaborations, the solutions to address what may be holding back the structure of good job creation, durable industries uh, across the different neighborhoods and their communities that can lead to the, you know, the, the wage growth that we need. And so I, I do think it needs to be, this is where there is a federal regional partnership uh, to tackle, I think, what are very tough uh, economic challenges that we're, we're undergoing right now. I think one of the challenges every community has uh, is to figure out what, wh who they are. Mm -hmm. I, 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 you know, Herb Kelleher, the, uh, the uh, founder, of, or one of the founders of uh, Southwest Airlines, has always been one of my business heroes. Uh, and I've, I've, I've looked at Southwest as a great example. Southwest has never apologized for who they are. Early on, they figured out who they were, and then they became the best at who they were, which made them one of the most profitable and successful airlines in history. They didn't try to be a legacy airline or anything. And they never apologized. 
what you'll find is the temptation in communities is for Mesa to be San Francisco. Actually, that's not a temptation. Mesa is the most conservative big city in America. Believe me, they would not be. <laughs> to have not the same time, city. To be Silicon Valley. <laughs> or Pittsburgh to be Philadelphia or vice versa. And actually, as, as Amy said, everyone is so unique that sometimes on a local level, the biggest challenge is who are we? Mm -hmm. And building upon those strengths, because every community has challenges, every community has strengths. I mean, who would have thunk that in San Francisco, one of the biggest challenges is they've been too successful? Yeah. One million dollar house? You know, gentrification? That, was a, yeah. that wasn't a discussion 30 years ago in San Francisco, tw even 10 years ago. So, you know, every, I, I, we don't have that problem in Mesa, Arizona. We have other issues, but we have other, uh, other opportunities and other things. And that's, that's one thing, if, as you go back to your local communities, figure out who you are, because um, it's very powerful when you define what your strengths are, understand your weaknesses, and then build upon those without trying to be somebody else. I've got a question in the back. Hi, I'm John Blankstein. I'm an independent consultant with Market Street Strategies as my firm. This is for the mayor. Um, up here in the Northeast, snowstorms are the big problem, particularly with uh, the structure of government accounting rules. It's very difficult to put aside money from a year with not much snow to get ready for the next uh, years, and then actually difficult to spend the money if it's a if it's a low snow year. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if there's anything similar mm -hmm. governing a city in Arizona where you just don't know what you're going to face uh, at budget time. Well, I, I want to let you know that when I became mayor, I made a promise to my constituents in Mesa, Arizona, that their streets would never be clogged by snow. And I kept that promise. <laughs> uh, you know, every city has this one issue, and what you're talking about is the difference between ongoing commitments and one-time commitments. And I think one of the things that we learned through the recession is that many cities took short-term money, whether it was a federal grant or whether it was even uh, some sort of windfall. In my city, it was the selling of property, of, of real estate. And when I was in business, I never sold capital item and put it into operations. I always reinvested. Mm -hmm. And I found that most governments don't do that. And that was our, that was our sort of uh, uh, snow reserve that we didn't have. Uh, so we adopted a policy where we said whatever we have that is short-term, one-time, is not a guaranteed or close to guaranteed income stream, we would commit to one-time issues. We would, buy, we would invest in building something. We would do something that we knew would only last one year or two years and it would play out its budget. And I think that's one thing that cities really learned is that they have not made long-term commitments uh, uh, when they did not have pretty much assured, I won't say guarantee, but pretty much assured long-term revenue sources. And that's, that's a discipline that I think across the country uh, people have done. And for example, now in, in Mesa, Arizona, we have a, a reinvestment fund where if we sell excess property land or whatever, we turn around and, and reinvest it in other capital items. Uh, we built the Chicago Cubs, a uh, a uh, hundred million dollar uh, um, facility without raising taxes because we took excess property that was completely non-productive, sold it, reinvested in a very productive. You know, spring training in, in Arizona is big business. Hundred plus million dollars a year. Uh, Sixty plus thousand people come from Chicago. That was a good thing. That probably wouldn't have happened ten years ago. That prop that money would have gone to cover the budget to pay for raises. That was the special thing when we talked about Labor. bad contracts. A lot of times cities would get a windfall right about the time they were negotiating a union contract and they would they would uh, commit themselves for five to eight years with one year money and that's one reason why a lot of cities found themselves in horrible uh, horrible things so it only compounded the natural drop in revenues is that they'd made these long-term commitments based on short-term revenue streams great so uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna go about five more minutes so we'll take another question or two depending on how long the questions are and how long the answers, <laughs> the answers are. are. I like the answer. Um, so yes, sir, over here. Thanks, uh, I'm Bill Glasgow from the Volcker Alliance in New York. Um, this came up in the earlier panel uh, just, just briefly in the, in the, bad, uh, the bad policies uh, section. Uh, is there is there a federal role, uh, or what is the federal role in helping uh, in helping some cities at least address their considerable retirement obligations, uh, which are uh, which are in a real impediment to economic growth, especially in in a city like Chicago that that has not only its its city and school district uh, pension issues, but it's in a it's in a bad neighborhood. 
it, it has it has county pension issues, uh, water district pension issues, state pension issues. Philadelphia is much the same. Uh, so you you're in a you're in an inescapable inescapable trap in in many ways. <laughs> well, I, I guess my question is, and speaking purely from a political standpoint, because this came up a lot, um, I've been, and my predecessors have been very, very judicious in planning and investing, and we don't have that problem. Why should I bail somebody out who, who, does. who didn't, yeah. for whatever reason, political or otherwise? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the big issue. Yeah. Um, I don't know why Chicago or Detroit or others are in their problem, but I can guess. <laughs> And it's a lot of the bad policy. So I think the political realities are cities and others who have invested a lot and have, and have been prudent in their fiscal management are not really willing to shift resources and money to bail somebody out who they believe, rightly or wrongly, was not uh, prudent. So, and I, I would add to that by saying I think there's a federal role. Uh, I wouldn't describe it as a bailout role. I think, I think that have, would have its own enormous sets of problems, both politically and economically. But there has to be a role around what the best practices are and the monitoring and the evaluation. Uh, and that sounds like a regulatory answer, which isn't going to be very welcomed at the local government either. But it could be attached to other big ideas, right? Which is we know there's a gigantic infrastructure maintenance shortfall or other sorts of needs at the local government level with where if there was a larger role and it was somehow attached to sort of other sorts of monitoring and evaluative structures, uh, we might actually create a more resilient sort of model that cities would operate in that the federal government would be facilitating in some way. And by the way, the, the problem is, is that it's a two-edged sword because when a Chicago or a Detroit or somebody does get to the point where they fail, believe me, it affects everybody. And so this is a, you know, even though I may feel I didn't compete that, I didn't uh, uh, contribute to that, if there is a failure in a city, and like I said, there's 19,000 cities and towns, and believe me, when Detroit went under, when San Bernardino, California went under, every city and uh, uh, town in this country felt it, every hospital district. So we recognize that we're all in this together. It just complicates the, the issue. So uh, we're at time, and I need to wrap up in order for a number of things to happen next. Uh, would you please join me in thanking our speakers? Uh, so I want to thank you all uh, uh, for being here today. I want to leave with a closing comment, which is um, we never have enough time for these conversations to really get through the gamut of the issues that could come up. Uh, what I would challenge the people in this room, the speakers that are here, to think a bit more about is I think we all kind of punted a little bit on the what are the federal, state, and local kind of mix of policies. I believe in bottom-up sort of solutions. I believe the city governments will operate sort of in a fend-for-yourself fend mode. But I think to approach the scale of what it would mean to put cities in a better position, there have to be other responses at the federal state levels. And we've been going in the wrong direction for too many years, too many decades at this point. So I challenge us to think and talk a little bit more about, OK, we know it's hard. We know the politics are difficult. But how do we get there as we go forward? So I want to thank a few more folks. First, the team at the Urban Institute. You saw some of them up here. But there's a whole team here that made today's event happen. Um, please join me in giving them a hand. I'd like to thank all of our speakers again, both uh, the morning, se uh, the first session this morning and the second session. Uh, and then I'd like to say that the, the video and an archive of this event will be loaded onto the Urban Institute website. So if you wanted to watch it all again or you wanted to share it with your neighbor um, and you're not following Bob Inman's uh, Twitter account uh, and all of the reaction to it, uh, you, can, you can find more information there. So, and thank you once again for all being here today. Thanks.